My meeting with Kelvin started off like any job interview. I asked him a typical first question, which was, tell me a little bit about yourself and, and what kind of work experience do you have? The young man sitting before me was about a 28-year-old African-American gentleman, handsome. He looked uneasy and a little embarrassed, and while looking down at the table, said, ma'am, I don't have any work experience. So I paused. You know, he was my first applicant for a job with my new enterprise, and it was clear that he was not a typical job applicant, but this was also not a typical job. So I asked him, well, tell me, Kelvin, what did you do, you know, that got you in trouble? And he said, well, ma'am, I was a drug dealer. And there was another uncomfortable pause. And I asked, well, uh, were you a good drug dealer? He immediately sat up a, a little taller in his chair and, and he said with confidence, well, yes, ma'am, I, I was. So I followed up with, well, what made you a good drug dealer, Kelvin? And he said, as a matter of fact, ma'am, you know, it's really competitive on the block and, and I have to manage my inventory. I need to keep my prices competitive and I've got to give out a few samples to prove the high quality of my product. And, and he went on. I sat listening and was so completely surprised and, and really impressed, you know, with his business acumen. When he finished, I said, Kelvin, please, don't ever say you don't have work experience because you do. You have really great work experience and skills. The United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. There are 2.1 million people living behind bars right now. 90% of those men and women serving time, they'll be released. That's roughly about 700,000 people a year or a little more than the entire state of Wyoming. So yes, you know, America is quite good at locking people up. But we must remember that one day, most of these individuals will serve their time and they will return to their neighborhoods seeking a second chance, a second chance to work and to earn an honest income. The stigma of a criminal record is, is the biggest barrier to employment for returning citizens. It just doesn't matter that they have great skills or a winning personality or demonstrated a commitment to their U-turn. We consistently ask our formerly incarcerated job seekers to declare their mistakes of the past by asking on every job application to check the box, have you ever been convicted of a crime? You know, I believe that if you've served your time for your crime, you've served your time. You know, we as a country, we have a responsibility to help them re-enter society and to set them up for success by ensuring that they have stable housing, a network of support, and yes, a good job. But we failed at that. And this is also why I believe our nation's recidivism rate is so high. Over 50% of incarcerated individuals are incarcerated again within three years of their release. So like Kelwin, most crimes committed are nonviolent drug-related offenses. Making people check that box on an employment application that requires disclosure of a criminal record doesn't just hinder their success in re-entering society, but it also means that employers are missing out on a huge talent pool, 700,000 people a year. Instead of painting a broad brush, you know, we should ask ourselves, what is the relationship of the crime to the job? Is there one? 
My point of view is that these crimes are committed because of the ills of systemic racism and poverty resulting in too many poor options that lead to poor decisions. I learned this when I relocated from Denver to Chicago for a job to launch a new workforce development organization whose mission was to address the high rate of unemployment in a community on the west side of Chicago called North Lawndale. I started my work by talking with residents and after some time found that a theme was emerging. And I heard over and over again that my son is coming back and wants to work but can't get a job. Or my husband is coming back and we need him to get a job. And members of my congregation are returning to church and they need a job. It motivated me to commission a study and found that 60% of the adults in the community had been justice involved and three quarters of the crimes committed were nonviolent drug-related offenses. I talked to formerly incarcerated residents in the community, like 50-year-old Gerald Whitehead, the oldest of seven brothers and sisters, who was a functional heroin user who shared his pain and anger of being rejected over and over again whenever applying for a legal job. You know, he said he felt like a nobody and that it was worth lying about his background just so he could work a few months before they would eventually discover his background and fire him. I knew in my heart that we needed to do something very different and step off that traditional path of job readiness training. I understood the desperate and immediate need for a job, but I also needed to respond to the broken judicial system and help change the narrative to unburden these folks from a stigma focused on the mistakes of their past and not who the person is today. So you're probably wondering now, what job was Kelvin interviewing for? Well, it was to be a beekeeper. I started a bee business. And why not become the first employer of record for those who were coming back after serving their time? So why honeybees? Well, the idea was inspired by a former colleague who was an urban planner and an environmentalist and invited me to join them for dinner with a group of friends who were veteran beekeepers. And this is where I learned that beekeeping is passed on through word of mouth or even better, storytelling. So it resonated deeply with me that regardless of a person's academic level, beekeeping could be learned easily and, and nearly by everyone. I also learned that honeybees are social insects and each bee has an important role to play in the hive at each stage of its life cycle. They are important and there aren't any throwaway honeybees. It takes 50 bees, in fact, to generate one teaspoon of honey. I've also learned that honey takes time to cure in the hive. And if you attempt to eat honey before it's ripe, it can actually make you sick. Reentry happens, and it's quick. Reintegration from incarceration, however, takes time. It takes time to unlearn the mindset and the tools that made you a successful inmate. It, it takes time to learn a new set of skills and create a new circle of support. And more importantly, to restore your self-worth and discover your voice. Like my friend Elaine, she shared after her years of incarceration, you begin to understand 
you are no longer a number, but a person, a person with a name. So with the help of my team, we created Sweet Beginnings, a company that extracts urban raw honey and creates honey-infused skincare products. We offer full-time jobs for three months to previously incarcerated individuals like Gerald, who are trained to become beekeepers and learn about extracting, tending bees, jarring honey, filling orders, packaging, shipping, and, and selling. And once they're ready to move on to find employment elsewhere, the creative, non-traditional job experience that they've had now makes for really interesting conversations in future job interviews. By shifting the uncomfortable focus of one's past mistakes to discussing honey extractions and various aspects of beekeeping, it shifts a future employer's perception and they become curious. They begin asking questions about honeybees and slowly begin to see our job seeker as interesting, productive, and a viable job applicant. Despite the national levels, less than 10% of our workers have returned to prison. And although I'm not gonna paint a broad brush here either, this is hard work. And the trauma, the injustice, and the stigma that our employees have lived through takes a toll. And not every story is a success story. Gerald never returned to prison, but he continued to battle his addiction and passed away two years ago at the young age of 54. But Kelvin, who was hired and went on to work for us for nearly two years before securing a job working in manufacturing, he did experience a few close encounters with his parole agent, but he pushed through and is a responsible, loving father who's taking care of his two daughters and a son. Working with Honey was his foot in the door and a crucial step in building his resume and his self-worth. Imagine what's possible if people took a lesson from the honeybee and helped people with prior justice system involvement feel valued, productive, and like they have something to contribute to the world. Because they do. When I talk about my work, my friends will often say, but wait, where, where do the honeybees go to collect nectar in North Lawndale? And I'll tell them, well, we have beautiful flowers in North Lawndale, but honeybees, they don't discern between what we see as humans as a flower or a weed. They're only interested in drawing the good out of that plant source and transforming it into something that is sweet and new. Thank you.